feels like I can read your minds. <laughs> You're thinking, what is that weird thing on my head? Well, I promise I'll get back to that. But before, I'll tell you that my prediction is that in the next 10 years, body-worn devices such as this one will have a larger impact on human health and well-being than the medical field itself. There's a growing number of people who have started tracking themselves and quantifying their life, and we've started to talk about this new phenomenon as the quantified self. The availability of low-cost data capturing devices has led people to self-track all kinds of aspects about their life And people worldwide meet up in groups and share their experiences in self-tracking. We also have a group right here in Copenhagen. And people use smartphones, they track their exercise, running, even taking pictures of the food that they eat. And people have a vivid imagination. They track all kinds of aspects. It's hard to come up with something that people don't track. But actually, it's not really a new phenomenon. Humans have always been curious about getting a deeper understanding about ourselves. The ancient Greeks talked about this phenomenon as know thyself. And Benjamin Franklin is known to have rigorously self-tracked what he referred to as his 13 virtues. And that was more than 200 years ago. So he didn't have the technology that we have today, so he had to use pen and paper for his self-tracking. So being a very old phenomenon, we can ask ourselves, why do we suddenly experience this increased interest in self-tracking? I believe that part of the answer is in enabling technologies. With computing getting increasingly mobile and low cost. So today we carry smartphones. And a state-of-the-art smartphone is a really complex computing, communication, and sensing device. So it used to be us looking at computers, looking at mobile phones, and commanding them what to do. But now it's the other way around. With the array of embedded sensors that are in a modern smartphone, They are now looking at us, they are listening to us, they know where we are, and they know about our social interactions. So smartphones can tell a really detailed story about who we are. A very simple example is the Kindle book reader. It knows where we are, and it knows how we read a book. So by observing us, smartphones can learn about our intentions and can predict what we're about to do, even before we know it ourselves, simply because smartphones will know us better than we do. So in a result, we'll have a more humane interaction that is less command-oriented and more conversation-oriented. And a part of that conversation will be smartphones telling us about ourselves giving detailed insights into our behaviors, our mobility, and social interactions. So when we look at mobile data sensing, we clearly see the patterns that emerge. And the digital traces that we leave behind. Data generated from our everyday interaction with machines and create new opportunities for studying human behavior in a level of detail and in a scale that was previously impossible. I'd like to illustrate it with this graph. So on the x-axis, we have the number of participants in a study. And on the y-axis, we have the amount of data that we capture about each participant in this study. So this maps out the space of different studies 
of human behavior. And there's basically two extremes. On the other uh, left-hand corner, we have studies where we only have a small number of participants, but we have very, very detailed information about those participants. The other extreme is in the lower right-hand corner, where we have an enormous population, but then we only have very, very thin slices of data about each participant. So a metaphorical way of describing this challenge is that we are trying to understand the world that is behind a door, but we cannot open the door. The only way we can get insights is by looking through this tiny keyhole. However, with large-scale mobile sensing, with the multitude of data that we can get from devices and from sensors, from servers and transactions, and if we put all this together, we suddenly have new opportunities. We get to move to the upper right-hand corner where we have a lot of participants and we have a lot of data describing these participants. At least, that's the idea. That's what we are trying to accomplish in a study that we are currently carrying out at DTU that involves mobile sensing. And that way, we can at least try to make this keyhole bigger. But it's not only smartphones we can use to capture this kind of data. Another trend that has gained increased interest over the last couple of years is body-worn computing and sensing technologies. A wide variety of low-cost body-worn sensors have become available, and it's also become an integrated part of the many devices that we use as part of our everyday life. So that could be our wristwatch, ear devices, glasses, and many other devices. So here are just a few examples of these so-called self-tracking devices that have become very popular recently and that I have used myself as part of my own personal self-tracking experiences. So I wear in my pocket a little device that counts the number of steps that I take each day and it maps out my activity levels. And my watch is giving me continuous readings of my heart rate, the temperature of my skin, and it also maps out my sleeping patterns. So just to mention a few examples of how we can get deeper insights into our own behavior. Think for a moment about the very first cars. They didn't have a dashboard. So you couldn't tell how fast you were driving and you couldn't tell how much gasoline was left. You basically had to guess about those numbers. And as a consequence, you would end up getting hurt, you would hurt somebody else, or would you simply get lost somewhere? If you think about cars today, they are loaded with sensor technology and software. And the irony is that you can read more about the health condition of your car on its dashboard than you can read about your own health condition. Think about it. How much do you know about your current health condition right now in this very moment? And that brings me back to the thing on my head. What I have here is a smartphone brain scanner. And I'd like to give you a very brief demonstration of this system. So that's something we have developed in our lab at DTU, where we've taken mobile sensing even further by developing this fully portable system. So you're probably wondering, what am I seeing on my screen? I'll show you. This is what I see. This is a 3D model of the brain. It shows the activations as they occur in my different parts of the brain in real time. And we use this off-the-shelf neuro headset that has 14 channels, 14 sensors, and the data that it captures is wirelessly sent to my smartphone for real-time processing. So as a result of that, I am, so to speak, able to hold my own brain in the palm of my hand. And watch the activations in these blue colors. So it's actually the other way around. It's not me reading your minds. Right now, you are sort of reading my mind.
But then, of course, we can ask the question, why do we want to measure and understand the brain? I believe that the relationship between our minds and behaviors is one of the key components to improve health, well-being, and productivity. Think about it. Everything we do is essentially controlled by our brain. So if you can understand it better, we can get a better understanding of human behavior and interactions. So this demonstrates that by applying mobile sensing, we're able to measure things that were previously impossible. We can bring things out of the lab, into our pockets, and into our everyday natural environment, and allow us to measure any time and in over long periods of time. So that is a way that we can sort of move to the upper right-hand corner of the graph that I showed you before. If we put all this together, a metaphorical way of describing the kind of systems that we envision and what it would mean to us as individuals, it's kind of like creating a dashboard for the self. So that would be devices that continuously acquire behavior and biometric data about ourselves. So 24-7, 365. So not only when you go to the doctor for a checkup, you'll be able to answer the doctor accurately about how much exercise you get or the quality of your sleep. You'll be able to present continuous measurements of your heart rate, blood pressure, rather than a single data point that is generated when you occasionally visit your doctor. In fact, in the future, why even go to the doctor in the first place? Because our smartphones and sensors are going to continuously monitor our health state and well-being and alert us if there's an emergent problem. The sooner we can detect there's a health-related issue, physical or mental, the better the chance we have that we can do something about it. People with a chronic heart disease can benefit from monitoring and alerts. Same thing with diabetics. Or people suffering from depression. They can benefit from detecting changes in patterns of how they interact socially and their mobility. So I'd like to leave you with these thoughts. Today, we can sign up to become blood donors and organ donors to help in medical situations. Part of the research that we're doing at DTU, we're trying to figure out ways in which you can also become a data donor. So we have new ways of helping scientific research and medicine. My prediction is that human data and dashboards for the self are going to have an enormous impact for millions of people in terms of health, well-being, and productivity but benefits for both the individual and society. Thank you.